Welcome to Blood and Business. I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. Today we're taking a visit to the cemetery to remember a part of American history whose grave is still warm to the touch. As children, my sisters and I actually went to a show, but our kids will only hear tales and myths of the animals, the ringleaders, the tents. You may mourn their passing, or you may disagree with the ethics of the entire idea and be glad that this chapter has come to a close. This sibling set founded the longest reigning circus dynasty America will ever see. They are the The Ringling Ringling Brothers. We're at the end, and this is where everything just (laughs) implodes. Yeah. (laughs) In part two, which was the last episode, we talked about the financial crisis of 1907. They are just now merging with Barnum and Bailey Circus. So they've just become the official circus kings of the world. They have completely monopolized, especially the American circus. So they're kind of joining the ranks of the Carnegie's, the Vanderbilt's. Yes, because at the time, the circus was basically, like Cassie said, the entire entertainment industry. Life is starting to get to the mature years, and they're starting to lose their brothers. Two out of the seven brothers have passed. Mm -hmm. Their mother has also passed. Right now, we're at the pinnacle of the Ringling Brothers circus dynasty, so we're going to kind of take the roller coaster on the way down. So like we mentioned in the last episode, Otto has already passed, and then Al, the firstborn, has passed, and this was like his dream. And so when he died, the brothers made a settlement with his wife, Lou, that gave them the ownership of the house. They like had a really weird uh, family dynamic where they were like, we will take care of y'all, but we are definitely going to be in control. In control, for sure. They promptly told her that their baby sister, Ida, needs to take her family and go live in Al's house. But what they didn't know is that Lou, when she left, took absolutely every piece of furniture, every curtain in the place. So when Ida got to the house and they got there to like an empty box, she's like freaking out, calls her brothers and her brothers are like, it's no big deal. And so they send the latest like newest, most high quality furniture to furnish the entire house. Her son is the one that like wrote the book that I read and got a lot of these stories from. So he said that they were just like showing up by truckload with all this furniture. Like they are not hurting for a dollar at all. You're saying that Ida's son is the one who wrote the book. Wrote the book. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was thinking Al's and I was like, wait, So did Al have kids? No, him and Lou didn't have any kids. She was the one who actually performed in the circus with them and was kind of like the circus mother to all of them. Their dynamic is so weird, but we have such little information that it's kind of like hard to get a really really, good picture of what was going on. But because they were so close, you would think that she would almost be one of them. Yeah, and like they wouldn't be taking the house away from them. And it's still the very, very early 1900s. So I think that they just had a different perception of women. It wasn't that they didn't love her. It was just they did not see women as needing a position of power. You know what I mean? Like Yeah, they but then they gave the house to their sister. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of weird. To live in it, yeah. But they were, she was married and she had kids. I don't know. That's a good point. It's just kind of weird. Her house, like, yeah. Why you would you think that they house? would just keep the money and le- let her have the house. Yeah, they did build all like custom homes, and maybe they just wanted to keep like the house in the family. Oh, and I, that's another thing I didn't remember until just now. Al's house was right across the street from the little shack that they all grew up in. So mm. like maybe it was a bit of a sentimental. The location. Maybe they just also viewed the like sibling relationship as more important than the marital relationship. Maybe that just trumps, you know, blood is in blood. Their mind. And yeah. you're not blood. It was kind of like Al's possessions didn't really belong to him. It belonged to the, the family, brothers, the yeah. family. And so they just did with it what they saw. That's true. It's so weird that they think of everything like that. And it feels wrong, but it's like if all of the brothers kind of agreed to that. And yeah. just it was an unsaid, like, you bought your house with our money. So it's from like our obviously business. Obviously ours. Yeah. yeah. Kind of calls back to the first episode where John wrote that letter at the beginning of their career that said, we'll be back, whatever yours ringling brothers and he was writing to his parents 
And so it was just, they were just one unit. (laughs) Alf T. ended up dying three years later in 1919. He lived just long enough to see the biggest show that they would ever put on. The combined Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, the greatest show on earth at Madison Square Garden. After the First World War ended and movies and automobiles became more of a household presence, Charles and John knew that the American people would no longer have enough interest to support two simultaneous Mm -hmm. circus tours, and so that's why they ended up combining. And the farm towns were no longer isolated either because of railroads and automobiles and, well, automobiles, (laughs) cars. That makes sense. Yeah, so they were just more connected to the world at large, and it it wasn't like, oh my gosh, we're seeing a light bulb for the first time. We need to go to the circus. It was just a different fun weekend thing. Exactly. It wasn't like they needed the circus anymore. So, though the circus was still important to the American people, it used to be the single greatest event of the year, and it just wasn't that anymore. And then the other thing that more mobility brought about was the option for the people in the smaller towns to go to just one big show at a big city. It wasn't impossible for people to travel anymore. So they were like, okay, we're just going to do one. So they combined them and the show was even bigger than it had been. But the other reason for just doing one show was there was no longer so dang many of them. One or more of the brothers had always been on the trains with the crew to make quick decisions on the spot. Circus life was about as unpredictable as you could get as far as careers go. So while the preparation obviously was crucial and helpful, it was often more about the ability to like improvise on a dime and having an owner and one of the brothers there was super, super easy to just like demand authority and people just kind of fell in line. And when it wasn't one of the brothers, there was much more confusion and like a power struggle and all of that. So it just got a lot more hairy. When the U.S. entered World War I, a lot of their employees had actually joined the military. So then they lost a bunch of employees and it was just inevitable that they needed to combine and do one show. So they combined the two tours into the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey combined shows, The Greatest Show on Earth. What a title. what a mouthful. (laughs) When Alf T. died, he left his full share to his son, Richard, who was a full third of the Ringling Fortune. With how the sons died and how they reallocated all of the funds and stuff, he was 33% of the shareholder. Man. Yeah. I wonder how common that is to to continue to, like, redistribute you well, know it's yeah. like the, every time someone died they just made the 100 percent again and then yeah we kind of started over from scratch like what were they doing <laughs> i don't know they weren't even a corporation for like a decade into their business so it's just like not what they necessarily cared about no and i guess that they just figured out oh we'll just cross that bridge when we get there the brothers all together only had three sons they had like some daughters too but seven brothers had three boys and that's it So that's probably also another reason why calling back to either episode one or two, when we were talking about how they treated the nephews like they were just kind of like all of their children. Because there weren't a whole lot to go around. Yeah, it's not like they had freaking 30 kids amongst the eight of them. So that makes sense. Richard was the only one out of the boys to even receive a financial inheritance from the family business. This third of the shares that Richard inherited gave him also a say in the management decisions of the circus, and Charles and John handled it quite gracefully by simply ignoring him altogether. (laughs) If you are not a brother, you can shut up. You literally don't matter, which, I mean... It sounds really harsh and rude, but also kind of like rightly so. Their entire life has been working for this circus and building this dynasty together together. and it would be so hard for even if it's like okay you are the heir to this right it would be but like you weren't here you weren't and i was and he was and you weren't (laughs) yeah the freaking 60 years later so i wonder why richard does it say just because he literally just richard was interested in the circus and that's why they gave him part of the share because i'm i'm kind of shocked that they even gave him 33 percent that's insane the only heirs to ever really have a hand in the family company were actually ida's two sons so these are not part of the three boys that the brothers have these are their nephews and 
they were named John Ringling North and Henry Ringling North. And Henry is the one who wrote the book, and he was front row. Both of them were very, very close to their to their uncles and very involved in all the circus stuff. They actually received shares from the family company, but they didn't inherit them. They actually ended up buying their way into the family business. What they did inherit was the most valuable of all, the Ringling Touch. They managed the family circus successfully after losing their uncle's leadership, And Richard, who actually inherited his portion of the business, tried to start his own circus and was bankrupt after one season. So at this point, all of the brothers had died off one by one, except for Charles and John. There had never been anything but love and loyalty recorded among the brothers until Alf T. passed away. But when Charles and John were left alone to divide the dynasty between them, things got a little messy. And it definitely would be a different dynamic when you've got like, okay, if you've got seven brothers, everyone's voice is equal, everyone dukes it out, family meetings, all that, and then there's just two of you. And it's like a tug of war back and forth, and there's no one to really mediate or Mm -hmm. be a third opinion. So they butted heads a lot. And John was like a middle child, right? Charles is the fifth brother in birth order. John is the sixth. Okay. Okay. So they were both middle children because Henry was the baby boy and he was the seventh. Maybe two. I mean, obviously, there are only being two left. That changes the dynamic yeah. entirely. And like you said, there's not a third person to kind of like mediate or take someone's side and like kind of vote the other person out. It's so the different. power like balance is just so much completely. Harsher. Yeah. And also the fact that they are right next to each other in birth order might have made it harder, too, because I feel right. like if it was the oldest and like with the middle or the oldest and the youngest, there, there would have been a natural. Yeah. A lot more of an age difference to kind of like make the oldest feel like they had more of a say. And I just feel like there's so much more of a buffer when you have a lot of years in between you. And mm-hmm. because they were right next to each other, it was like. They were too equal almost. Yeah, and it didn't affect their circus management. People say that they still acted in complete solidarity as they always had when it came to circus business, but personally, it got pretty hairy. And a lot of people speculate that it was actually Charles' wife that was always prodding at him to outdo John, which John was the more naturally extravagant like this, out there brother. Yeah, the one second to Al. Yes. Right? And so and like who loved the circus the most. Right. And who had like the most drive, the most the will to just go out, conquer, learn new things, travel, like all those things. Um, John had a lot more of that just naturally in him. But Charles' wife always just wanted to be competing. And so if John got a yacht, Charles got a bigger one. When John formed the Bank of Sarasota, Charles founded the Ringling Trust and Savings Bank. This is like Sarasota, Florida. <laughs> this is like the freaking Bouvier sisters all over again. Oh my gosh. I'm and telling you, there's something about two that is just like not a good idea. It's not if you good. Have, have one more other sibling, than two kids. Yeah. If you have one other sibling, maybe this isn't your your story, but I feel like when there's only two, oh my gosh. It just there's the no one else makes like an imbalance like yes. it's just too because then you're to able protect. to compare yeah so easily and so black and white and when there's multiple it's like well people are just different yeah rather than being like like you're both girls you should both be like this yeah three's a crowd and in siblings i think that that is mm-hmm. a positive yep Sarasota, Florida was not big enough to need two banks in the early 1900s so it was just like clearly a competition a callback to one of our previous episodes before disney world was built central florida was mostly just cattle ranches there were more and more people moving out there by the 1920s but not enough for two banks in one little tiny town and maybe that was part of the problem the stage was too small for two ringlings so charles knowing that john ate breakfast around 3 p.m each day always scheduled their business meetings to start promptly at 9 a.m. So naturally, John was always late, and it was his tardiness to one of these meetings that actually led to his financial downfall later on. Yes. Oh, it's just, it hurts. It was a bad habit, I can but admit. Also, like, but you have worked your whole life. Do you not deserve to just be able to freaking wake up at 2 yes, o'clock in the you're afternoon? you're an entrepreneur. You own the freaking entire circus industry in the U.S., you can wake up whenever you want to. But no, Charles was like, I'm so going to make my brother look bad every single month. Such a freaking sibling thing to do, but also like, ooh, so petty. 
Regardless of their competition and jealousies, when John got the news that Charles had a stroke in his home, he practically ran across the lawn to get to his brother's side. Charles' wife informed John that he was too ill to be visited, so John sat and waited alone all day in one of their rooms. What a freaking petty. I just can't even with that. Like, you do not prevent two brothers from being with each other when it's the end of their lives like that. Yeah, one of them might possibly be dying. That is horrible. And she was not backing down either. Like, he just sat there and waited. He didn't ask any questions. The doctor that was treating Charles reported that he didn't say anything at all, but that there were tears pouring down his cheeks as he sat with his brother when she finally let him in the room. After Charles took his last breath, John simply stated, I'm the last one on the lot. Oh, it's like instant tears. Can you imagine being the last one? Had to watch all six of your brothers your best friends, your business partners, the person, your brothers. Like the people that you have done life with. Just one by one. And Six is only, a lot. That is a lot of grief. That's a lot. And going from having so many people in your life that you can count on completely, 100%, and then having no one. I mean, he had his wife still at this point. Oh my point, God, but the loneliness, I cannot imagine. So much loneliness. And also the fact that they had such a distinct life and they were able to understand each other completely because mm-hmm. they were all there in the same position. They grew up together in that shack. They didn't have plumbing. They worked their butts off. They stayed in flea bag motels. They freaking did it. They made it work. They got to the top together. And nobody else Could went understand. through that journey yeah. with him. After his last brother's death, John considered himself the sole proprietor of the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. Of course. Richard had already been written off in his mind, and Edith, who inherited Charles III, his wife that was freaking spiteful and didn't get along with John, was only a woman, of course. And like I said, they just, if you weren't a brother, he they didn't really see you as having actual say in the company. So that sets up the context for you. In 1929, John's hardships really began. His wife, Mabel, had actually been hiding from him for several years that she was fatally ill and her strength was finally run out by that spring and she died in her bed with John at her side. And he was completely blindsided by this. He was devastated. She had hit it so well, only her doctor knew. And she was like a really, really lively, happy person. And she was a lot younger than John too. So up until a few days before she died, he had never even contemplated life without her. I would be so pissed. Like I get that I get when people do that, how they want you to... They want to live, like, the quality of life all the way to the end. Yeah, and they don't want you pitying them or being sad sad and making it such a big deal. But also, that kind of sucks because I would so want to know so that I can prioritize just, like, hanging out, having fun. Also, just mentally working. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you want to savor every moment. But also mentally, like, just being completely blindsided by that and after all of his brothers have just passed away one by one and now his wife and now he's actually alone actually alone he was so unprepared that since he hated the color black he was left with nothing to wear to her funeral like he literally just did not account for it he actually ended up borrowing his butler's uniform to wear (laughs) to her funeral yeah john told his nephew henry who wrote the book i will never be gay again Remember that meeting that I mentioned that he was late to that was really bad for him financially? Mm -hmm. In 1929, the Madison Square Garden contract was up and it was time to renegotiate. A date was set with the management of the garden, but John did not show up. Maybe it was his pride that got in the way, thinking anyone and everyone would just wait for him. Or maybe he was just like so eccentric that without his brothers to kind of fill in the gaps or keep him in check, he just lost track of where he needed to be, but there's no recorded reason for why John missed this meeting. There are records of him setting up lots of engagements and then standing up important people. (laughs) We don't know, but when the directors of Madison Square Garden are sitting there waiting for him, he doesn't show up and they're freaking irritated. So when they finally did have the meeting with him, 
They told him that they were no longer reserving Friday nights for the circus and they would not sign a contract unless he agreed that the circus would not play on Fridays because they were just done accommodating him. Prize fights were becoming increasingly popular and they actually made more money on Friday nights with the fights anyway. And so after a violent conversation, John told them, and I quote, exactly where they could put their contract and that the circus would be opening elsewhere. The Garden promptly made a contract with the American Circus Corporation, which was a compilation of five other smaller circuses under one ownership, and they were also the only real competition that the Ringling Circus had for the upcoming 1930 season. John was so hurt that he was just blinded by anger and it clouded his business judgment. He had some right to be upset. The two circuses that him and his brothers owned had given their business to the garden for the last 50 years straight. Either the Barnum and Bailey or the Ringling Brothers Circus had opened their season at the garden every single year since the 1880s. Yeah, you would think that that would like give you some freaking loyalty and yeah. leeway. Like, okay, he was late to a meeting or didn't show up, blew them off for a meeting, which sucks and is rude and like maybe make it harder for him to sign the new contract but or ask him can i speak to someone else can i speak to your management whatever but to just completely replace them after that many years that's a lot of years 50 years yeah and get this too it goes it gets even worse the ringling brothers and barnum and bailey combined circus had helped build madison square garden's reputation as the most desirable venue in all of the world and now they were throwing them out just to strike a deal with their enemy and both the first Madison Square Garden building and the new one were built for their circuses. The old one was built for the Barnum and Bailey show and the new one, John had actually been head of the board in building that venue for the combined circus to play. Oh my gosh, yeah. That, so it's personal. That cut runs deep. So in John's brain, there were only two options, either by the garden or by the American Circus Corporation. <laughs> You have to like just love the power and the I love it. like the way that they just choose to spend their money and their time and resources like what they just did with it. It's not what people I think most people would have done with it. No. But it is so funny. It's just so true to them and it's just like so they just spiteful did like what they want. And they give me the tea. For like it, so tell me all the tea. It's not annoying how spiteful they were because they weren't like trust fund kids. Like they literally no, worked, they worked for, for every and dollar. They were literally nothing and like had to just climb the freaking yeah, ladder. And they like, were the American dream. Yeah, paved the way for themselves. So it's it's just funny. Like I totally get where he's coming from. He probably would have had a, like an easier life if he could just let it go. But yeah. it would be easy to like get bitter and spiteful at people when you're in your such blood, a sweat and tears, life, your soul, yeah. everything that you have ever had was put into this thing that you created and built. And then when people like go and disrespect, respect it or like don't give it the reverence and respect that you feel like you freaking deserve for. Yeah, especially when you freaking basically half built Madison Square Garden. Like, yes, and you uh, also, he probably feels like, oh, I'm the only one left to defend my mm. brother's legacy. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I'm sure he was so stressed out too. And like maybe that was one of the reasons why he was late to things and sleeping in. Like, Yeah, and was, just sad. Just sad, tired. Depression can wreak havoc, you know? Yeah, and with some people, depression is like sadness. And with some people, it is irritability. I get very irritable when I am depressed. Yeah, I feel like and his came out as maybe anger. Maybe his was anger, yeah. Okay, so those were his two options in his mind. But the problem with buying Madison Square Garden was that it actually wouldn't solve anything for him because the other circus would still have the contract, so they'd still be opening Madison Square Garden. So he bought the American Circus Corporation out from several of his old circus friends for around $2 million at the time. Can you imagine if he would have bought Madison Square Garden? Are you kidding <laughs> He should have bought Madison Square Garden. Literally the only reason that he didn't was spite. Yeah, you know? that wasn't the point. That was not the point. <laughs> so he only put down about $300,000 and took a loan for the remaining $1.7 And with that, he said, I'm playing the garden next year because now he owned that circus too. So this didn't actually seem like that bad of an idea. It was a profitable business and 
They had a lot of physical assets that came along with that circus. He also knew circus business very, very well. So it was within his area of expertise. His buddies on Wall Street said it would be no problem selling those shares and that he'd be able to pay back the loan pretty quickly. The stock market was really hot at the time. So he did his due diligence with like asking for advice with experts and all that. Making sure it wasn't a total emotional decision. Right. But do you remember what year this was? Oh, no. Oh, no. I know what's coming. (laughs) 1929. The American people had been living beyond their means, like everyone as a whole. So when the New York Stock Exchange corrected, it wasn't a small adjustment. It crashed catastrophically. The whole thing failed, and it sent America into the Great Depression of the 1930s. And there went his opportunity to sell his shares. So again, from his perspective, he's blindsided by his wife dying after all of his brothers are already gone. Then he's blindsided by Madison Square Garden just throwing him out on his butt. And then the freaking stock market crashes and completely blindsides him as well. And he probably is just feeling like he's hitting every freaking branch on the way down. Like, give the dude a break. So he was able to transfer the debt and ownership of the American Circus Corporation to the Ringling Brothers Corporation so that it wasn't a personal debt, but it still was his obligation. And of course, all of his other businesses went bad as well. Every business in the country did. The circus, which netted, profited $1 million in 1929, was doing so badly in 1931 that it had to close early. They couldn't even finish out the season. The painful thing is that John would have been able to write it out had it not been for that one piece of paper promising $1.7 million to the bank for the American Circus Corporation. And just for some more context, because we love her, we love context, $1.7 million in 1929 is equivalent to over $27 million today. Ugh, pain. He lived out the rest of his life at his home, Cadizan, or House of John, with his personal assistant and his nephew, Henry Ringling North. Again, the one who wrote the book. It was a Venetian Gothic style with a terracotta exterior, incredibly, incredibly lavish and extravagant. It was a testament to the American dream of the Roaring Twenties, so think Gatsby. He paid $1.5 million for it in 1924, which would be $24 million in today's money. But he was all but completely broke when it came to liquid cash. He never sold a single painting from his collection, never sold his house, never sacrificed anything from his estate because he had actually promised it all to the state of Florida for when he died, he was going to pass it to them and it would have gutted him to diminish his contributions to his state that he loved. He bought food and electricity with little business deals here and there and he lived a very moderate lifestyle inside his castle basically, like you said. They live within their means. He had to protect that because can you imagine not have anything left of the legacy that you and your brother spent your whole life building? Yeah. But also walking around the house and knowing how dirt poor I am and how I have literally worked as hard as a person can work for my entire life. How gutted would you be? I would be an alcoholic. (laughs) (laughs) Let me tell you, I would be done. That was kind of the end of the circus era as well. Yeah. So it's just like everything just died off It's with John. just falling apart. The sky is falling. I mean, when it rains, it freaking it pours. pours. And Henry is Ida's son, right? Yes. He's Ida's youngest, youngest son. son. Okay. And Ida is the youngest of yeah. the Ringling mm-hmm. siblings. Oh, wasn't Henry? Am I crazy? Is Henry not the youngest boy in the Ringling siblings? Is his name Oh, Henry? yeah. So he named... She named Ida named Henry after her brother right above her in birth order. And then he was his, the one who with, with the bad mental health. Yes. Um, and then he was an alcoholic. And guess what? Henry's older brother is named John Ringling North. And so she named her firstborn after John, who is the sixth brother. Right. So, so just it's the, two, the sixth, she picked seventh, the two, and eighth. She picked the two siblings that were closest to her in age Mm -hmm. and that might allude a little bit to how close she was to them just relationally yeah and those were the last two alive right charles Mm, Charles. was uh, was still alive but so like john is the one that uh the first nephew is named after and he's the one that they lived with him they were super super close to john john ringling's personal devastation came in 1932 he got a blood clot in his leg 
and to prevent amputation or blood poisoning, he needed to stay off of it and take a rest from the stress of circus business. He chose to hide out from his creditors at his longtime friend Sam's hotel. It was called the Half Moon Hotel in Coney Island, New York, and the owner, his friend Sam, had lived about a million lives in his day. He started as an acrobat at age nine, and then since then he had been a candy butcher, don't ask me what that is, <laughs> an usher, cowboy, actor, singer, press agent, and producer of kinetoscopes. All that said, this guy Sam, he's ambitious, okay? John underestimated his ambition, and Sam had been deceivingly kind and accommodating while John had been sick. While John was bedridden in his hotel, Sam went and put together a couple of investor groups and bought John's loan from the bank and then negotiated with the two other Ringling family members that owned a stake in the circus. Can you tell what's coming? I'm really scared. Uh, they called a meeting one day and John was ambushed with a blackmail proposition to restructure the company. Also, this sounds familiar to the Walt Disney story. Things were freaking savage back then. So savage. And maybe they still are. Maybe we're just so not in that rich world that... (laughs) We ain't got the power or the money to know about that. Nobody cares about us. (laughs) The other thing that happened while John was out was that his loan to the bank had defaulted. He had somebody paying the, the payment for him, and so he just like assumed it was getting taken care of. And the debt had been reduced from $1.7 million to just over $1 million flat, but one of the payments was missed while he was sick. And so this gave his old friend Sam and family members the footing that they needed to assume control of the company. They threatened to have the company declared bankrupt if he didn't comply with their requests. Ugh. Again, his whole entire life's work and the legacy of his brothers at risk. And he was the one who like originally was the one who was really like money savvy, right? Yeah, he is like if we made a profile or like a little business card for each of the brothers, his would be the entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Like he loved business. He was the one who like started selling pot and pan cleaner. Yeah, at originally age ran away at 12. twelve. Yeah. So he would have been gutted if his business had gone under under his watch, watch. as well. Yeah, that would definitely feel like you you failed your dream and your lifelong pursuit, but you also failed your brothers. John was absolutely bewildered after walking into that meeting, confused to find enemies where he thought loyalties lied. He was under every assumption that Sam was his true friend, and though he pretty much ignored (laughs) the other two family members who owned company shares, in his mind, he had protected their bottom line and guarded their interests always, even if he didn't, like, ask them what they wanted to do. A little self-righteous, but... A trend for all of the brothers. They just always assumed that, oh, I've got your back, I'm protecting you, you don't necessarily need to be involved. Exactly. In that meeting, across the table from him was family, Wall Street friends, and even the Ringling Brothers Circus lawyer representing the other side. In his prime, John never would have been discouraged. He would have been antagonized. Even just a couple of years before this, he would have hired lawyers who would have told him that they could not throw the Ringling Brothers Circus into bankruptcy after one missed payment. But John wasn't in his prime. He was sick, he was shaken, and he was alone. So he agreed to turn the circus into a stock company, give away 10% to the creditor groups that Sam brought in, and split the rest between himself and the other two ringling heirs, Aubrey and Edith. Aubrey was one of the daughters, and Edith was Charles' wife. I do not understand how these shares work. Like, why do random... I don't understand. I don't know either. I'm just reporting exactly what I read because <laughs> I'm not too sure, like, where how? where did Henry's shares go? Where did Alf how did T's Edith and whatever? this other chick get shares? Like, they're all family, but if you would think if one niece got some of the shares, like, all of the nieces would. Right. It just is weird. I don't know. I'm sure there's a rhyme to the reason, but I don't know it. Yeah, same. Also, I I would do want to note, since so much of the last part of John's life, like, is what we're talking about right Mm -hmm. now, Henry, the one who wrote the book, is the one who's living with John in his last years. Not only did he have, like, a front row seat to the circus and the circus and all of the uncles yeah like he is literally the only family member living with john through all of this so i think it's a really accurate picture of what was really going on yeah 
So the million dollar debt that John still technically owed, or the Ringling Brothers still technically owed for that circus corporation that they bought was to be assumed by the quote unquote new Ringling Company. But all of John's assets would be seized by the company until the debt was paid. Like they were making sure that he takes the fall for that. They can take the company and all the good assets, but they want him to pay for that debt. Which if... All of the brothers were still alive and that was like what they decided to do. Okay, rightly so. Like John is the one who got into a stupid mess. Yeah. But like he's the only one who technically has made all of this money and it's technically all his in the first place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I don't I don't think that the brothers who passed away and left the other two shares to the family members would have ever. ever. They are turning over in their grave right now. Yeah. And that makes me even more mad that they would blindside him like this because he is who are you to one. have the freaking right to do that yeah or uh, i don't know that just sucks on so many levels like that's a screwy thing to do and they already know that he's not in a good personal financial situation anyway it's yeah. not like he's just rolling in money and it's like oh, okay he has to pay for it whatever yeah he's literally doing little small business deals here and there so he can buy toilet paper and food the other family members are freaking sheep too because i don't even think that they would do that without the sam friend instigating oh, the whole thing they were yeah. just like following along still not a way that i would want to get an inheritance by like, no. screwing my my they already Family had an inheritance. Over. Like, it's just so stupid. Yeah. They already had a third of the company. For they doing what? Exactly. <laughs> For being more. Like, you're fine. So at the first new company meeting, John was chosen as the titular president it was really just like a show type of a thing like he was president for his name so that it would look to the public as if a ringling brother was still the one in charge on his throne yes the one in charge and he would receive a token salary of five thousand dollars a year his checking account that he always drew from had always rested around fifty thousand dollars so this was like nothing and sam the friend was the quote-unquote friend, was elected to be general manager. He had absolutely no circus management experience whatsoever. How did John, like, agree to this? Was he just so done? Like, he was just tapped out, so emotionally, mentally done. Just numb. Yep. They just saw an opportunity, saw a man vulnerable, and they took advantage of his vulnerability. My gosh. And then Aubrey and Edith, the other two family members, and those Ringling Circus's lawyer were all to be vice presidents of this new company. John recovered from his illness, regained some of the movement in his paralyzed right side, and his slurred speech cleared up. So, like, he was in a bad shape when this happened. So he probably felt powerless already, Mm -hmm. you know? Like, physically, for Mm -hmm. sure. Like, he really couldn't... He wasn't as mobile as he once was. They just... Yeah, and anyway. literally took advantage. Like the epitome of just taking advantage of someone who they know is vulnerable. not going to be able to stand Defend up themselves. for themselves. Oh, so he was able to recover mostly on the physical aspect of everything, but in another sense, he never recovered. He was scared and suspicious of everyone after that. Which another kind of like callback to the Disney story and even the Bouvier sisters. Yep, I. I think that I would be free. I feel like I'm already kind of paranoid about like who I let into my inner circle just because I'm like a pessimistic personality type, You, I guess you could say. But not even pessimistic. You're just protective and suspicious and realist. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you're pessimistic. (laughs) You do not like being in a vulnerable vulnerable position. That's what it is. Yeah. I don't like being feeling vulnerable. And so it's hard for me to trust people. I can't imagine if you've gone through this and have been in that like very sharky business, like higher up elite world, Mm -hmm. how much you have to watch your back. And it's even more intense in the Disney story. It talks a lot more about it in in the Bouvier story as well. The more you have, the more you got to watch your back. Whether it's justified or not in the Disney story, I think it pretty much was. And in this, it sounds like it is how he's starting to feel paranoid and like he just can't trust anyone Mm -hmm. it's so sad sad because it's so isolating yeah i think it's a very common thread that we have seen on another note i think that that's one of the reasons why all of these siblings stories have been so powerful and like have been such an emphasis on the sibling relationships because at the end of the day like those are the people who you have known your entire lives and 
they've known you your entire life and with that comes a bit of comfort and yeah you can you feel like you can lead, let your guard down whereas like friends and r- random other family members are screwing you over so his two nephews john ringling north and henry ringling north and their mom his little sister ida took care of him after that and they kept him company they also traveled with the circus and did a great job managing it his two nephews John scraped all the pennies he had and was able to send his nephew Henry to school at Yale. Henry wasn't fully aware of just how tight John's finances were until after his uncle's death. And he actually wrote in his book that he thought back to an exchange during the summer before his senior year at Yale. They were getting on an elevator when John asked him, Buddy, do you really care about going back to Yale next year? Completely astonished, Henry replied, Of course I do. It's my senior year. The best one of all. John just said, okay, buddy. He went back to school that year with an unlimited allowance as he always had. Ugh, I cry. Henry said that he would never have gone back to school if he knew the circumstances his uncle was in. He would have just gone to work for the circus that year instead. And John must have known that and did everything that he could for his family. In his last days, his favorite thing in all the world was to have dinner at his sister Ida's house. She would make big meals of food that they ate as kids and everyone would gather around to eat together. One day, John was reading the paper and said to his nephews, the Cole Brothers Circus is going to parade in Pensacola next Thursday. I'd like to see it. It had been 15 years since any of them had seen a circus parade. When they combined the Barnum and Bailey show with the Ringling Brothers Circus, it became too big to have the parades anymore. On the day of the parade, his nephews drove him out to Pensacola. They got a small hotel room with a balcony overlooking the street They sat in silence as they watched small boys running, roughhousing, little girls in their best frilly dresses waiting for the circus. As the tigers, acrobats, and elephants rode by, Henry looked up at his uncle's face and saw a motionless man with tears streaming down both of his cheeks. His brothers were with him for one last time. (laughs) And this is where I actually lose it. On December 2nd, 1936, John Ringling died. He had $311 in the bank. His estate was officially appraised at $23,500,000. Today, that would be almost half a billion dollars. Members of the Ringling family controlled the circus until 1967 when they sold it to the Feld family who kept the name. In 2017, the Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus closed out its last tour and walked off the lot for the last time ever. Oh, chills. Like, so many chills. Cassie has real tears streaming <laughs> down her face for those listening on the podcast. I have real tears in my eyes. I just can't. Like, I am dreading the day. I'm dreading the day when my dogs die. I can't imagine. Like, parents dying is super sad, but you know. You expect that. Yeah, you you're know? literally born knowing my parents are going to die before me. But your siblings, man. <sighs> and the, the and just like the looking back on him going to that circus and having that moment of just the smells, how everything sounded, sounded like view. just that strong of a distinct experience. And it just reminded him all of those little mundane moments being with his brothers, building their dream. And gosh, I just can't. Like starting in their 20s. Jeez. Oh, it's so sad. It's so sad, but it's not also even in their so 20s. good. One of them, and it might have been John, was 15. When, yeah, John was. John mm-hmm. was 15 when he started on the yep. circus. So, And when his when his big brother Al locked him in a room and forced, forced him, him to learn the music. Yeah. <laughs> but it's so sad in like such a good way. You know nostalgic. what I mean? Nostalgic. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like a nostalgic. so powerful. Like, endearing. It's so powerful because there was so much good in the memories, you yeah. know? Yeah, what is that Winnie the Pooh quote? There's like a Winnie the Pooh oh, quote Oh, yeah, it's it. something about like how how lucky am I to have something that I can miss so much or something? Yeah, something like that. We're butchering it, but yep. that is the epitome of this. It's like so heartbreaking, devastating, so sad, but also the only reason it's so sad is because, is because it, was, it was so good. Yep. In episode two, I did a little PSA about... I don't know, around these big life events, funerals, marriages, babies being born, like you want your siblings around. And I get that not everyone is able to have this and that sucks. Like I feel for you, my heart is there with you grieving that relationship that you can't have. But if you can, 
if you have it in you and if the other person is willing to have a relationship, a tight-knit sibling relationship, please try. Like, give yourself that grace to try and give yourself the permission to ask your sibling for that relationship if you do want it. And it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be... I don't know, picture perfect and it's not going to be like your friend's sibling relationship. And it may not even be what you expect it to be either. And just like knowing that whatever it is and whatever it looks like is worth it and is better than not having a relationship. Or not, you don't want to look back and and feel like, oh, I should have voiced my expectations more or I should have told my sister like, or my brother, hey, I want to be closer. And even just saying that and if they don't take you up on the offer... That's just like f- with friends yeah. or with dating, like okay, it's that's horrible, on them, not on you. But at, at least you tried, you, yeah. and at least you can feel like okay, I did my due diligence. So that's my little PSA part two. Another one of Bethany's best tips for siblings is if you want to be close and you like love your sibling, but you don't have a lot in common, and there's not really much to talk about, and you're like, I want to talk, awkward. but like, what the frick do we talk about? Like, I want to be friends, but like, can we be? <laughs> yes start like just like the Ringling Brothers start a little side business together start a hobby together learn a new language share with them your top 100 movie list and ask for theirs like little conversation starters that sound stupid or that like would be good for like a first date or something can also be really helpful with siblings and building up that sibling relationship yeah and like give yourself a break give yourself something to talk about you know what I mean like don't try to just like be close and don't just assume that everyone who is close just was born with things in common and like it was just meant to be and it's not in the cards for you like you can make things like I always tell Cassie I swear that almost anyone could be in love if they it's like okay I used to watch this um movie I don't even know what it's on it's on like Hallmark or something called Love Comes Softly (laughs) and it's literally about like not an arranged marriage but like a marriage out of desperation and like survival out of practicality mode. and love does come softly like you can start out hating someone but if you both are just determined on making it work like you will find the good in that yeah. other person and I think with sibling relationships you just there's so much added pressure on it because it's like it's not like dating or even marriage where like there is an out with siblings it's like you were born to be friends and like if you're not there's something wrong with you or there, you're flawed in some way I feel like there's that pressure. Call it like it is and be like, this is awkward, but I want to be friends. So like, let's figure it out. Yeah. All right. We love you guys. Thanks for listening to all three parts of the Ringling Brothers story. I think it was super interesting. Please, please, please uh, give us some feedback. Start a conversation with us. We want to hear every little opinion that you guys want to spew at us. Even if it's that we need to stop advocating for the people in the (laughs) stories and just tell it like it is. Let us know any of your thoughts. We'll take it. You can find us on Instagram at Blood and Business, on TikTok at Blood and Business. You can leave a comment in the YouTube section or you can rate and review on iTunes as well, which helps us a ton um as a little baby podcast if we have like interaction from people and reviews then it will help other people new people find us who might want to listen to the stories too we'll catch you guys later bye Bye.